Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome on to and this winter's day. Uh, I think it's a case of winter draws on at the moment, and um, we uh, and as um, one person said, it's, uh, the weather is reminiscent of her home in Scotland. <laughs> but um, however, uh, so I give you all a welcome for those of you that have braved. Uh, the weather today. Uh, I'd also um, ask you to uh, take note of what's in the, the news sheet and particularly uh, the sad news that uh, our brother Jim that used to sit over in the corner passed away on Wednesday and we'll, um, I've been uh, discussing with Graham and we're waiting on the uh, the family as there's a possibility of a memorial service uh, later on. So, uh, and um, although April is a day of, or a month of uh, uh, birthdays in the church, I think um, next week I think we'll be able to uh, give you a list of a, a whole collection in, for that week. Also, I'd like to remind you that next Wednesday is our um, uh, sweet hour of prayer and uh, at one thirty, and you'll all welcome uh, to it. And also, next Sunday, there will be the um, uh, uh, Graham continuing the, the uh, service next week at 11 a.m. And uh, in the meantime... I'll hand you over to Graham now. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Good morning. And, uh, shall we join together? We're going to begin by singing a hymn of praise to God, hymn 126. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hearts to heaven and voices raise. Please be seated and shall we join together in prayer. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you that we can come before you 
with this great international word on our lips. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord, for who you are. And at this time of the year, especially, we give thanks for the great redemption that Christ, your beloved Son, has purchased for us at Calvary. And we thank you that that wasn't the end, that that was really only the beginning. And we ask in our service this morning that you will remind us of your presence by your Holy Spirit, that you'll speak to our hearts from the Scriptures, you will draw near to us as we draw near to you, that you will forgive us and receive us as your children for Jesus' sake. Our Heavenly Father, we ask now for your presence with us and with all who are around the world, in every language and tongue, on all the continents of the earth, give you praise and thanks. And as we around the world today join in praising the Lord Jesus, we are united with those through the ages who have done the same thing. So, Lord, be with us now and speak to us in our time together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask Christine to bring us young at heart. Thank you, Christine. Well, good morning. Um, in the school holidays, we often enjoy doing things with grandchildren that we would not do on our own. And last week, um, we set off to explore some of the UUs around Melbourne. Does anyone know what the UUs are? Well, I think we're going to get a photo of one. They're a series of sculptures done, I better stick to my notes, created by the renowned Victorian artist Alexander Knox. We haven't been able to find out if he's any relation of Alistair Knox, the, the architect. So a UU is an imaginary Australian creature and its shape is loosely drawn from the wombat and the dugong. It has chameleon abilities and can change its skin color and patterns in an instant. It's a mysterious being when adults are near. And it, so the UU can be shy and hide. Well, they didn't hide from us. It has a courageous and playful personality around children who it loves to help and comfort. So, the plan was these were all to be placed around the city last year to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the founding of the, RC, of the Royal Children's Hospital and to raise funds both here and in Geelong. <clears throat> well, of course, COVID delayed all that, but... Um, yeah, so there's an example of three of them. <clears throat> One of my friends, who also comes from that place which is so often cold and wet, she has now visited all the UUs with one of her granddaughters. Um, as far as I know, they've been taken from their sites and gathered in one place, and they are going to be auctioned as fundraisers for the children's hospital. Our grandchildren were less interested in them, thankfully, actually, because we got to go to a couple of exhibitions instead. But I thought I'd take this as a jumping off point to share a little about the RCH. Now, most Melbourne families have some links to it. And I think, we, yes, we have a collage there. So it will become clear what the photos are. I don't, th well, we didn't live in Melbourne when our children were very little, though we did move here when our youngest was five. But we had a very long association with the children's hospital between 1986 and 1996 when a dear young friend Thomas was in and out of hospital with leukemia 
and he died there on February the 6th, 1996. You don't forget significant dates like that. In 2011, you, most of you know that our grandson Artie, at the age of four, began his long association with the Children's Hospital when he too was diagnosed with leukaemia. But unlike Thomas, he recovered. And I think as a result of the death of Thomas and more like him, they discovered more boys were dying from leukaemia than girls and changed the treatment or extended the treatment for boys. He, Arte is very well. And one of our children is actually on the staff of RCH. Now, what I read about it, it has provided world-leading care to Victoria's sickest and most vulnerable children and young people up to the age of 18, children with chronic conditions like we've got um, friends whose grand grand grandsons have haemophilia and they have to be handed over to the Alfred when they turn 18. And the staff at the children's feel that because they've cared for these children for 18 years and they don't see them as really adults yet. Okay, where did it come from? Well, the founding doctors, William Smith and John Singleton, had a vision to help sick and injured children at no cost to their families. With the help of a volunteer ladies' committee, they brought their vision to life and the Melbourne Free Hospital for Sick Children opened its doors on the 9th of September 1870, so last year was 150th, with just six rooms. The story of how it grew from such humble beginnings to become one of the world's great hospitals for children is as impressive as it is unique. So, the, Dr. Smith and Dr. Singleton relocated the clinic from <coughs> Carlton to what is now Exhibition Street. A committee quickly assumed the management of the children's hospital and rules were established, including two, to aim to prevent the spread of infectious diseases. <coughs> Dr. Smith was an early ad adopter of the microscope in clinical medicine, and he continued to do a lot of research throughout his career. He published articles in the Australian Medical Journey, which allow a glimpse of the hospital in its early years. You can find so much about this on the internet. Some of his articles graphically describe patient symptoms and the doctor's efforts to diagnose and treat them. In 1962 then, the Royal Children's Hospital in Parkville, which some of you will remember, was opened by the Queen, who of course has been so much in the news these last this weekend. In 2011, I want yes. The Royal Children's Hospital, as it currently stands, was officially opened by the Queen, and our grandson and his mother. He was not. Yes, I'm not sure if he was still an inpatient. I think he might have been an outpatient, but they got a glimpse of the Queen in her car because they happen to be there. Could we go to, for any of you who haven't been there, it wouldn't be, it's not fun if you've got a sick child, but it's an amazing building for children and their families. And could I have the one of Elizabeth and Philip? Yes. One of my favorites of the Queen and Prince Philip who died on Friday is the one at the top because I think in so many ways it exemplifies what everyone's been talking about that theirs was a partnership a 73 year long marriage that was a partnership 
he, I think he didn't find visiting children's hospitals as demanding as some of the other things he had to do because he had a twinkle in his eye with children. But I just loved that photo. And this is that exciting day. I want to go back to the Volunteer Ladies Committee. I'm back to my notes now, Irene. It was there at the beginning, okay? The Royal Children's Hospital Auxiliary's gift shop is still a major fundraiser, as is, of course, the Easter Telethon. The, I've, I've mentioned that the UUs will be auctioned to raise additional funds. I didn't believe one of my granddaughters when she told me that on Good Friday, their telethon raised more than $17 million. That is how this hospital is loved and valued. I'd love to know where did they all come from Victoria, all the contributions, I don't know. I heard the CEO of the hospital being interviewed and I quote, we couldn't be the great hospital we are without the support of the community. It enables us to buy the best medical equipment and to employ the best clinicians. And we saw that in the years between Thomas's death and Artie starting treatment, the strides that had been made, and some of them directly out of research at the kids. I know this is an oft-repeated theme of mine, but I think the RCH is yet another example of what can be achieved when we as human beings, created in God's image, work together for the good of humanity. Those women on that first volunteer ladies committee in 1870 were not equipped to provide medical services. They used their abilities to raise funds to equip those who could. Could they ever have imagined what those early days would lead to? I don't think so. Nor could Dr. Smith and Singleton. Various parables come to mind, but I thought today I'd just read the very short grain of mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field, Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds can come and perch in its branches. And I thought of all the children and all the parents who have perched in the branches of our CH. May God bless us all. Thank you, Christine. And I must say that when Christine's notes came through to my computer yesterday, I started looking up some of the history of the Children's Hospital and found it absolutely fascinating. So I encourage you to do that. And if you ever do drop in, uh, go and look at the meerkats. Uh, that's, Christine hasn't mentioned the meerkats. Um, Alistair is going to bring the Bible reading to us. If you come forward, Alistair, I'll make sure there's enough light. Ah, I can see. Wonderful. Thank you. This morning's reading is from uh, St. Luke, chapter 24, reading from verse 13 to uh, verse 35. And uh, they've just uh, discovered that Jesus is not in his sepulchre and they're, they're on a, a bit of a, a jaunt out of Jerusalem. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. That's about oh, seven and a half miles. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, 
Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he who should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since those things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them, which were with us, went to the sepulchre and found it, even as the woman had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they said to him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. So he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and brake, and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us, while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them breaking bread. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Amen. And may God bless unto us the reading of his holy word. Thank you, Alistair. Just a word of explanation that I, I've dimmed the lights at the front of the hall so that the image on the screen is sharper. But I'm aware that we need a brighter light here for, for readers, especially readers with older eyes, people who, have, like me, have a clinical condition called presbyopia. It has to do with older eyes. So uh, I've been looking around for a lamp that would suit this, but uh, we're working on that. So we've got you in mind, Alistair. Thank you for that reading. It was good to hear it. Now there'll be your offering will be uplifted. And thank you.
we bring you but your own, whatever the gift may be. Heavenly Father, receive our gifts and accept our worship for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our hymn is 196, Come Holy Ghost, Our Hearts Inspire. Hymn 196. Well, today our theme is walking with Jesus. It's not too hard to pick that up from the Bible reading that Alistair has just shared with us. Uh, If you're wondering about the background scene here, this is uh, the Western New York walked, um, the Western New York Emmaus Walk. So in the state of New York, there is an organization called the WNY Emmaus Walk. And it's a, a function of the United Methodist Church in America to help people in their spiritual journey and uh, so I've used an image from their website today and as we think about walking with Jesus I want to uh, pick up on three things first of all just the very idea of the walk that Alistair has read to us of and then I want to think about uh, the written revelation his written revelation I've called it here And then I want to think about our shared experience. So uh, three ideas, and you'll find that the the notes are in the leaflet, and I invite you to uh, take that and reflect on it at any time. So walking with Jesus. Uh, It's that same day, the day of resurrection. Two people are traveling to Emmaus. I've listed it as 11 kilometers. How many furlongs was it, did you say, Alistair? Three score, Three score furlongs, which you converted to seven and a half miles, did you say? Okay, so I don't know if you've got a day's walk in mind or an evening's walk, but uh, uh, I think 11 kilometer evening walk is a fair, a fair stroll. And uh, here are two people walking along this route. And uh, in the image on the screen, you can you can uh, maybe struggle to work out which one is Jesus. Here's a closer look. Uh, We've got one with a turban, one with a cap, and one with a hoodie. (laughs) But the one with the hoodie is all white. So I think we're meant to think that that's Jesus. Um, And we realize that they were not able to recognize who he was. We're told the names of one of the people, Cleopas, And his companion is unidentified. And I've said uh, that if the Cleopas here is the same as the Clopas mentioned in John 19, he may well have been traveling with his wife Mary. 
uh, which was a very common woman's name at that time, and she had been present at the cross on Friday, but we can't know because she is unnamed. And the unidentified person who comes alongside asks about why they're dejected, why are they downcast? And he's, uh, they're taking a risk that he's not spying out their loyalties. Are they really supporters of somebody who, you know, is a dangerous political moment, really? Cleopas explains that they're downcast. He says they had great hopes for Jesus of Nazareth, that he was a prophet who would set Israel free, that, but he was handed over by the Jewish leadership to the Romans to be crucified. Their thinking is very much based on this sort of physical world. They're locked into a, the nation of Israel and its place and the politics. And that's, it's very easy for that to happen. We, we, as earthbound people, we're used to physical things. And, uh, but, but we know that faith and hope and love are things which we could not do without. And there are many other qualities that are not quite hard and fast. Christine has talked about the transition from a six-room building in uh, uh, Melbourne to the modern hospital today. And we look at that and it is impressive, but what did it? It was a vision of people to provide free health care to children. That's what's behind it. That generosity. And if the generosity wasn't there, the structures would not have emerged. So we're thinking about what, I, what is it that's really going on in this war? Well, they were locked into thinking about physical things. And I want to transition next week into the Acts of the Apostles and do some thinking in the book of Acts. And we'll see at the beginning of Acts that... Luke records the same idea. They ask about the kingdom then as well. So at the end of volume 1, Luke 24, and at the beginning of the book of Acts, volume 2, this idea is still there in the minds of Jesus' disciples, that he's going to set Israel free from the Romans. Well, that's what they had hoped. This is the third day since he died. That very morning, rumors had begun to spread from the women who went to the tomb. They couldn't find his body. They told a vision of angels had said that he was alive. So some of them went to check this out. Peter and John said off at a run when they heard the news. They wanted to find out. They couldn't find his body either. It was the women who said it, but Jesus was not found. Mary, Mary Magdalene, said, I have seen the Lord. That's her message to them. Now, the unidentified stranger with Cleopas and his companion is sensitive to their feelings and he questions uh, his questions evoke all their disappointment but they have misjudged the situation and it's pretty brutal the way it's expressed in the authorized va- version fools it says fools i prefer it to say how foolish to believe this yeah. they were misunderstanding the scriptures he said ought not the christ the messiah to have died and then entered into his glory. So what we're discovering here is that they, hadn't, they didn't know their Old Testament. And I'm asking this question today. Are we moving into a kind of new dark age as far as knowledge of the scriptures is concerned? How well in our community do the, new, the next generation know their Bibles? It's, it's a, a, I think, a significant question. I want to suggest to you that there are lots of ways that you can grow and know more about your Bible. The Bible societies, of course, uh, produce Bibles in pretty well every language. Actually, if you go to the webpage, biblegateway.com, you'll find more than 100 different languages, the Bible in more than 100 different languages. You'll find about 100 different English translations of the Bible including the 1611 King James, the Good News Bible, dozens and dozens of others. So the Bible is there. You can read it daily on your phone in in a Bible app. For example, in the the Bible in one year, you can connect with the Scripture Union reading notes. 
You might have heard of CPX, the Centre for Public Christianity, which Australia started up in Sydney, and it, it makes uh, materials available, interviews with Christian people. You may have heard of Kurong. I hope you've heard of Kurong. It's a bookstore uh, situated down Blackburn Road and just at the corner of Vicky Street. And it started, I remember when I first came to Melbourne, 1980, as a minister, it was working out of a, a garage in, in Bandura. And I went to this garage in Bandura, and it was just lined with books. This man was selling books from his garage. And now it's a big store, big enough to have a small cafe in it. You can go there, talk to friends, read books, have a coffee, and uh, explore a whole world of Christian understanding and learning. Uh, and I've used this image before, not this image particularly, but this is about the Bible Project. And I want to encourage you, if you have a computer, uh, or even if you have a smartphone, to use the Bible Project. I can show you afterwards on my phone uh, that uh, there is a Bible available which integrates the written text and the animated text. Let me show you this clip from Luke 24 in the Bible uh, Project. Yes, he's passed through that and come out the other side. 
walking, talking piece of debris. And He's come out the other side, a walking, talking piece of new creation. So that's, if you uh, want to get into your Bibles and you, ha you haven't uh, found a way to maintain it, you might find the Bible Project uh, a way of, of learning more about it. Um, you might have noticed the question pop on the screen, those of you with sharp eyes, have you subscribed? The, the answer to that question is, uh, I have subscribed. It's free to subscribe. It just means you get their emails, just encouraging you uh, to bear them in mind in prayer. And also, the whole enterprise is crowdfunded. So they don't, they don't sell anything. They just make available this material. And if people appreciate it, they may send a donation. If churches appreciate it, they may send a donation. So that's how that works. So we want to think, you see, Jesus explained in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, what are all the scriptures? Jesus is talking here about the Old Testament part of our Bibles. And the Old Testament part in uh, uh, the Hebrew language uh, is named, the, it comes in uh, three groups here. The Torah, which is the, the first five books of your Bible. The prophets, which include... Uh, for example, Samuel, the books of First and Second Samuel, which were all about Samuel, but it also includes the named prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and so on. And it includes the Kethuvim, the writings. Now, these are Hebrew words, and what we're being told here is that the Hebrews shortened this. They took the first letters and just called it the Tanakh. Uh, so Tanakh is the Hebrew word for the Old Testament. And it's interesting, they rearrange it slightly differently from us. But it is the same books, the same 39 books that we have in our Old Testament, slightly differently arranged. So this is what was Jesus' Bible. We need to remember that. When he's talking about himself in all the scriptures, he's taking them to the Old Testament. And I think, uh, and I hope, that as he began with Moses and the writings of the prophets, they, they were starting to see things. We're not told all the detail here. But after the meal, they shared with each other how they ha had felt as he explained the scriptures to them. And how was it? They were warmed. Did not our hearts burn within us, as the old version says. Like there's a fire inside here. There's something powerful. And, and later on, uh, when they go back to Jerusalem, we didn't read this section, but when they go back to Jerusalem and they're discussing uh, with, about Jesus' body and so on, he, he opens and he refers to the law, the prophets, and the writings. That's what he said, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, which is the biggest book of the writings, are all specifically mentioned in chapter 24. So in this way, Jesus makes clear that the three great divisions of the Hebrew scriptures are about him. They're about Jesus. Now the challenge is to know the storyline. What's the, the narrative? Where do different stories fit in in the storyline? And that's all part of what we do as we gather as, as Christians at church, to discover from this volume, which from earliest times has been part of the Christian Bible, because all the first Christians were Jews. And Jesus was Jewish. And they went to the synagogue, the message went to the synagogues initially, until eventually it became clear that it was not just for Jews, it was for everybody. And then Gentiles started believing as well. And I think this, this year uh, we did something that I've not done before, and that is I've based our Easter meditation primarily on an Old Testament text. And you're probably tired of this image, but I've used the book of Isaiah because I'm convinced that you'll see deeper into the heart of Jesus if you see what moved him. If you read what he read and you understand what he sang and as you read the things that spoke about him. And so we've been discovering Jesus in Isaiah's fourth servant song. And in our regular worship here this morning and uh, uh, in our own devotional acts at home, we seek to fall down, as it were, uh, at the feet of Jesus who has rescued us and calls us to follow him. Forgiveness and his kingdom are open to us. As we learn of him, our hearts and minds are warmed. That was the, the great experience of uh, John Wesley 
heard somebody reading an introduction to the letter to the Romans. And as he heard, it was like, spoke to him. And he said, my heart was strangely warmed. That was the, tr the beginning of his great ministry. And so we too want Christ to reign in us. And he does it by his word. He lets us know what he's thinking. So we've thought then about the Emmaus walk and how Cleopas and his companion uh, were introduced to the scriptures in a new way. And what I want to do now is to just to think about our shared experience. I want to say, first of all, if you're challenged by any part of the Bible, you should please talk it through. Let me know. Not that I'm not saying that I have the answers. There are hard parts of the Bible that I'm still working on. But unless we look at it, we risk just making God the God of our own imagining. We just make God the one who gives us the bits we like. But there are difficult parts in the Bible, and we need to acknowledge that. And it's as we come and struggle with those that we grow in our faith. Not all things are equally clear. Some parts of Scripture are very challenging, but it says all Scripture is profitable. When the Apostle Paul wrote that, it was the Old Testament he had in mind. All Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. But the book of Deuteronomy tells us that there are secret things. There are mysteries that we associate with our faith which we do not totally understand or cannot explain. But the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But the things that are revealed are for us and for our children. And that is a wonderful thing. And so as we uh, think about what happened at the conclusion of this meal, things became clear that had previously been hidden. And what did it for them was the shared meal. They knew about the Last Supper. And they knew that Jesus characteristically at a meal would take the bread. Oh, I imagine it like pita bread. I don't know if you've tried pita bread, but you take the bread and he blessed it. So he prayed and then he broke it and then he fed them with it. So taking, blessing, breaking and giving. And this was what he did with his body, remember. He gave himself to them to feed them. And when we, so when we have a meal, when we pause to give thanks, there's just that moment when we acknowledge that our life really comes from him. Once more, we think about these things. And we're invited to look back and give thanks. You, you might have heard of uh, a piece of writing called Footsteps, Footprints, I think it's called. Um, this, is, this is that piece of writing. I remember hearing it long ago. Let me read it to you. One night a man had a dream. He dreamed he was walking along a beach with the Lord. Across the sky flashed scenes from his life. For each scene he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonged to him and the other belonged to the Lord. When the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand. He noticed that many times along the path of his life, there was only one set of footprints. He also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times of his life. This really bothered him. And he questioned the Lord about it. Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I've noticed that during the most troublesome times in my life, there's only one set of footprints. I don't understand why when I needed you most, you would leave me. The Lord replied, my precious, precious child, I love you and I would never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. It was then that I carried you. It's often as we look back on our lives, we realize that we've been journeying with Christ. And it's as this pair look back on their walk from Emmaus, and look back on all that had been written, they saw how things fitted together in a way they had never understood before. That the, the body of the Messiah had been broken and given for them. That there might be forgiveness 
that we could be forgiven, a forgiven people, that God could be with us day by day, not counting our sins against us, but embracing us and calling us, yes, you and me, his dear children. I love you. I would never leave you. It was then that I carried you. In Christ, we are a new creation. God has done something new, just as surely as the risen Christ was part of a whole new world that's coming in. I was interested to see in reading the history of to us, the influence of Christian people in early Melbourne, uh, the doctors and uh, Frances Perry, a woman who was the wife of the first Archbishop of Melbourne, she was the woman who chaired that committee of women who were concerned with the poor in Melbourne and that everybody should be able to have access to medical care for their children. A whole new world informed by a Christian vision of how things could be. It's, it's been flooding out. Uh, we'll read about it in the book of Acts, the most amazing story of rapid growth of a movement that was to turn the whole world upside down. May we be part of that as we walk day by day in this week with our Heavenly Father in the company of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us unite in prayer. We rejoice again today, Lord Jesus, that after your resurrection you came alongside the two disciples so gently to deepen their understanding of your self-giving commitment as Israel's true Messiah. We worship and adore you for the love you have shown to us. Herein indeed is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and gave his one and only Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Like those disciples, we sense in our own hearts the warmth of the Spirit's flame as we bow before you and think again of the bread broken, blessed and given for us. Purify our hearts. Remind us day by day that you're with us. We want to walk all our days in your company. Forgive our wandering Please stay close and hold us tight. This week we lift to you all who grieve the loss of loved ones. We pray for our Queen Elizabeth in her loss and sorrow at the death of her husband of over 70 years, the Duke of Edinburgh, asking that her faith will comfort her heart and sustain her and the members of her family. May they find solace in you. As a congregation, we are saddened by the death of Jim Evans last Wednesday, and we ask that you will comfort his family and guide them in the days to come. We pray also for the family of Hamish Goddard, who died unexpectedly last month. Sustain his widow, Georgie, and her two children as his absence weighs upon them each day. Comfort them with all who are in grief today. Heavenly Father, you have opened your kingdom to all who would enter. Work among us to draw those whom we carry in our hearts to yourself. Draw them with the cords of love. As the COVID vaccine rollout has slowed here and in other places with the AstraZeneca complications, we pray that everywhere vaccines are manufactured, the production will be maximized and the vaccines shared as widely as possible from Brazil to PNG. We pray again for people in places where violence and oppression hold sway over others. We ask for mercy for the people of Myanmar, for the Uyghur people, for war-torn Syria and Yemen. There are so many other places, O oh Lord, and we ask that you will have mercy, that there will be an end to corruption a turning over of the hearts of men and women everywhere, that we might do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, as the prophet said. We pray for those in our family and friendship circles who are burdened today, either in their physical illness, in mental health, or in their family relationships. 
We pray for those who have joined us online. And we ask in this moment of silence, that as we name loved ones before you, you will grant them your healing touch. So Lord, draw near, ease burdens, heal dis-ease. Through people who love you, help all to cast their care on you, to know that they are precious in your sight. Follow with your blessing the proclamation of the gospel. In whatever language, Christ is praised. May our voices join his acclamation. All this we ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 131, The Head That Once Was Crowned With Thorns Is Crowned With Glory Now. Hymn 131. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest upon you and those whom you love, today and always. Amen.